And sadly, some of those I, I don't know how to solve. I mean, that that's part of the problem too, is some of these that are just seem insurmountable or just, you know, I'm too busy, right? That's an easy thing to tell ourselves. And that's where I definitely encourage people to get help here and there, you know, if they can find someone or a specialist um, to help solve problems, because oftentimes you have to look outside the box, um, but sometimes we live in a box and we don't know anything that's outside of it. And if you don't know what's outside the box, someone else does. So, you know, either that or you're going to be spending, you know, a full-time job trying to figure that out. Yourself. Thank you everybody for joining us on another episode of the Pursuit of Purpose. My name is Chris Kiefer, and today I am joined by David Latterberg, who is the Vice President of Smart Charge America. And today, um, we are going to be diving into some automation discussion, um, strategy, scaling companies using automation, and um, probably talk about Airtable as well. Um, I I was going to tell you, I don't know if I said this in the email, David, but I saw that you spoke at Zapier's conference. Um, so for those listening, Zapier doesn't invite, you know, random people that know nothing about automation to speak at their conferences. So uh, I I watched the talk that they had posted, and I was uh, that's why I reached out because I was like, oh, this is we could we could talk all day. I love I use Zapier. Um, uh, why am I spacing on the other name? Make I don't know if you've dabbled in that at all um, or Airtable. Those are like that's that's what I do all day long. So um, without further ado, I'll hand it hand it over to you. You can give me a more colorful introduction of who you are and a little bit about Smart Charge America before we dive into automation stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, I'm, my name is David Lederberg, Vice President with Smart Charge America. We're a company since 2007 completely focused on the sale, installation, and service of electric car chargers. Uh, that's all we do all day long. Um, we do it in 25 major cities across the United States. You know, we're growing to 50 cities by the end of 2025. And so we're, you know, we're absolutely going to hit that on track still. And so, you know, our, our goal is to really just you know, move the needle on climate change, really, which is a pretty big deal. But, um, you know, electric vehicle charging is, is rapidly expanding in, in many different realms, whether it's residential, commercial, uh, just the service needs to keep these chargers up and reliable. So we're very much dedicated focus to that. In order to provide, you know, what we provide um, to our customers and also just do it in an efficient way, we have to automate. We, it was absolutely apparent very early on. Some businesses kind of hit a certain milestone, in my experience, before they start to automate what they do. But I saw an opportunity with Zapier to do that much sooner. And that's honestly, it's been a competitive differentiator for us. And more so, you know, how you utilize that automation. I've learned uh, a lot over time that allows us to be much more effective uh, with our customers, provide a higher, higher level of service, um, and just, you know, get to the end result much sooner. So one thing that I was very interested in um, getting your your thoughts on was just when you talk about uh, automation strategy or like deciding what to automate, how to automate it, because there's there's always a dozen ways to get the the specific thing done. What I would say is that it's not about that particular task necessarily, but it's like the whole ecosystem that we're trying to solve for and making sure that the automations that you implement in one silo are like prepping or helping out another silo. So yeah, talk to me about when you're, how long ago did Smart Charge America start? So we started in 2007. I got started with the company in 2016. So it was shortly after that, that we, you know, I got to set up on a full proper CRM and then, you know, ultimately ended up finding Zapier in that process. And what CRM do you use? We use copper. Okay. And then, um, yeah, so go ahead and I'll let you answer that question of just like, how do you think about strategizing before, or maybe, I don't know if you did prior, how much pre-thought there went in before you started fixing stuff, or now that you've automated a bunch of stuff, is there anything you would wish or advise people to plan before beginning? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so for us, we it started very small. We were just looking at, you know, what are the repetitive relatively menial tasks that are done on a daily basis just over and over again that are very repetitive in that fact, but also prone or easy to, you know, succumb to human error, right? And then the the absolute domino effect that has later on in the process when just something relatively small or innocuous happens, but creates this domino effect, everything else gets affected by it. And when I saw an opportunity to automate that where it takes the human element out of it and it takes the potential for human error out of it, well, then that solves a serious problem and it also frees up time. 
So it really started around that, all these repetitive tasks that I'm seeing. And then, you know, I'm just asking questions when you do this, how do you do that? You know, several employees in the organization would just come to me and have those types of uh, situations they're dealing with, and I would immediately automate them. Um, but what I started to learn over time is that I'm, I was kind of solving an itch in each one of those, and it felt really good as you get this nice little gratifying, you know, great, I Dopamine just freed up hit. some time. Yeah. You do. I, I swear it's addicting. Yeah. Um, but, you know, what you realize is that when you make all these changes over time, they start to rely on each other. And if something maybe stops working or breaks or maybe just something changed, then it can have a domino effect in that respect where maybe that previous automation or even in some cases you forget, you know, where this automation that I started with, where does that come from? Does it come from the first automation, the second or the third? Because they all start to rely and connect with each other. And that's where having like a single source of, source of truth is incredibly important. And then having that well-documented notes on these apps, you know, pro, uh, computer pro programmers are, tend to be pretty good about writing notes in their code. In other words, why did they write the code the way they wrote it? So when they go back later, someone else goes back. And I, that's one of those things I didn't do very good at all early on with Zapier. And they've also kind of iterated a couple of times where they made it easier for me as the Zap creator to put in notes of why did I do it this way? Because there's so many times where something happens or changes, I want to change it. And I'm like, why did I do it this way? You know, but then again, there's also me updating to, you know, using my new single source of truth, like Airtable very much is used in that way. Um, and that allows me to centralize information, uh, change it on demand without having to change 20 zaps. I used to change 20 zaps when one thing changed and that was just, that doesn't work. But when you add a single source of truth, you just update that and that all the zaps will adjust accordingly because of that as a yep. single source. Yep. So that's huge. What, when did you guys stumble across Airtable? Uh, so Airtable came to me when I was really struggling with like what I just described, where I had no single source of truth. It was just all over the place. It was I had to write whole new processes if I like added a new sales rep to update all these apps and make sure I didn't forget a zap to update. So it was very difficult. And I actually uh, hired a professional, uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Alex Bass at uh, you know a company now called Efficient App. And he came in and introduced me to Airtable and turned it into, I was basically using Sheets before, almost as a database, and Sheets is great as a spreadsheet, but it's not a database, right? Airtable is a database, uh, and so it was able to scale searches, queries, uh, tables, that's what Airtable is very good at, and certainly excels at, and that was really changed, redesigned the zaps, made them faster, used far less tasks, so really my zap bill went down, Right as I did that, so it's kind of a funny, ironic when you use certain ways of doing it. It actually allows you to use Zapier less in a certain uh, aspect, but it allows things to go quicker, more efficiently, uh, and use far less steps. So that just really streamlined and also opened up the window to, hey, there's much more I can do with this now. Like this, just it, you know, I started to understand it much better, and it was kind of a one-off project at the time, um, but it allowed me to scale to much greater heights and and much far beyond where we were at that. Point. Yeah, because there's also the automations capability directly in Airtable, which sometimes people don't realize that it's not. Yes, it's the uh, I don't know if you know Gareth Pronovost. He's a well-known YouTube Airtable guy. Lots and lots of YouTube. If you've ever watched a YouTube video on Airtable or watched, let's say if you watched a dozen of them, you probably watched four or five of his. He's out there all over. But um, the thing that um, he shared, which was. Uh, new a new definition or terminology I hadn't heard before is that first of all you're correct that Google Sheets or Excel is not a database it looks like it's a good way to visualize what a database is for someone that doesn't know what either of those are but it is a spreadsheet but more than that there's a tool that's called Smart Sheets that's been around forever and the primary difference and I'm just stealing this definition or simple explanation from Gareth between smart sheets and a true like database tool like Airtable is that uh, smart sheets doesn't have the ability to relate databases to each other. And Airtable does, you can make a database of con of people, a database of deals, a database of charging locations or whatever like database you want. And then you can say that this person, which is part of a database that has a bunch of, you know, data attached to that person, is now affiliated with this deal. And then I can, there's just so much more you can do with that as opposed to Smartsheets or Google Sheets, for example, you've got 
a drop down list of people which actually are not associated to anything at all other than the name in that particular drop down list and on on one level that might not seem like that big of a deal but the, like you just described the possibility of what you can do when they when you're actually associating the person and all the data that's associated with that person in another database like their date of birth their phone number their email their employee status like and now that's associated with a deal or an opportunity or whatever. Now it's like, oh, like you can, it's just like it opens up everything that you never even considered because it didn't exist when you're using Google Sheets. You know, I don't know if you have any other stories or, or realizations like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, back in, it was like 2006, I was still in business school and college. And at the time it was Microsoft Access, right? Early database. And, you know, we were talking, talking about inner and outer joins and what a relational database is. And that is the essence of exactly what you described, which is, uh, you know, having the references to multiple tables, multiple databases uh, connect with each other, which is, yes, that is the reason why blue air tables can be so powerful with Zapier. Yeah. The other thing or, uh, going back to what you said about, you said 50 cities that you want to be operating and installing in by 2025. Correct. And what was like when you came on in 2016, what was the goal or the aspirations of smart charge America at that time? We, we certainly want to be nationwide, but at that time we were only in the state of Texas, which is our home state. And, you know, which is, you know, easy and, and comfortable for us, but to get into all these other states, there's so many either regulatory challenges, um, you know, laws, state taxes, and just being able to operate the electric, you know, grid could be different in different states, in fact. So the design and the typical building code will be different in different locations. So there's so much to adapt to. And we learned that pretty quickly coming into new locations. Uh, but, you know, we're called Smart Charge America, right? So we, we can't not just smart be- Smart Charge not, Texas. Not yeah. Smart Charge Texas. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, I'm assuming, and this is, uh, I don't know if this was, in your mind, but I've heard Sergey, I think his name is the the CEO of Google or was at one time. Uh, he was talking about how they they anytime they're doing something, they're like, would this work if it was multiplied by a thousand? Um, and if it's not like, all right, cut it out. We're not we can't like we need another solution. So just like what that when you multiply by a large multiplier instead of like, oh, I wonder if this will handle two or three times the volume. It's like, you know, well, let's just shoot for the moon and say a thousand or ten thousand, because if it if it can work for that, then we're covered like forever. Right. Or for a very long time. And I when you said when I heard you describe this in that Zapier talk that you gave, I was like, oh, the that North Star of like, this is what we're trying to do and how it provides clarity in decision-making because it either helps get us there or it doesn't, or it's gonna help us for a little while and then it's just a pain again, or the problem doesn't go away, it's just a Band-Aid. But what were some things or give me like some stories about like situations where you've referenced like, is this gonna work in all 50 cities or in all 10,000 installs or whatever, where you've like, it opened you up to solve the problem in a better way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there are a lot of things like that where, you know, I would set up maybe like a table or database and think that, hey, we're, we're set up here or this will work in all these cities. And then I kind of get blindsided maybe in like California, for instance, where, you know, the permitting laws are very different. They're set up on a state level. And so the way that that works is that, you know, also they have rights that customers individually can pull their own permits. So if I'm a homeowner, I can pull a permit. Uh, that's not true in every state. Right. So when we add that new element in there, well, that just was unexpected. So that didn't scale. Right. So I had to redesign that database to work given that. And certainly, you know, we found additional states that fell into that same category. You, know, you kind of do one at a time. I didn't research all 50 simultaneously. Uh, you know, it's plenty of work just to add one. Uh, so it, it did require us to relook at it. Uh, even beyond that is just territories. So previously I was set up to, you know, I have multiple sales reps for a given area. Uh, and, and so we're again adding people very quickly, adding territories very quickly. And I was doing everything based on kind of a range of zip codes. But I realized that that started to fall apart very quickly because when you look at some of these metropolitan areas that grew very quickly, the zip codes are not sequential, right? So it's not an easy, you know, medium to high range. So I'd get something that was really intended for the Georgia territory, but actually one of the zip codes in a range of zip codes also falls into Florida. 
So then it would end up assigning it to Florida rather than Georgia. Like, so there's these things that you learn. And then, so I started to set up a matrix instead. I had to do individual zip codes for every single territory, right? And so it worked then, and it certainly helped to scale to do a range. But then ultimately, long term, I was like, all right, well, that, that won't scale. And I didn't know it at the time, really. Um, but just to, to have that as individual zip codes, uh, a little more tedious, maybe. But, you know, there's a couple tools out there that make it easy. But also allows me to swap zip codes pretty quick. You know, if I need to fine tune a territory, um, it allows me to do that rapidly um, because like the difference between Newark, New Jersey is a territory of mine. It's also, you know, New York, New York. Those are right stones throw across the river. Right. It, but they're two discrete territories, discrete uh, regulatory areas with different licensing requirements. So but they can't there's zero overlap, but they're directly. So next you'd to want to other. make sure that a sales rep doesn't have both of those or if they do, that they are very aware of the differences between those. Yeah, exactly. So we, we need to be aware of that. And, and certainly those are, that's not the very only instance of that. It's all over that we're finding that. Yeah. Another thing I'd love uh, just hearing about, what is the, I always preface it with, it doesn't necessarily have to be the most valuable zap or automation process, but the most impressive or like, and the reason I say it doesn't have to be valuable is because generally the volume, the n amount of times that it's used can, you know, increases in value. So, so there might be certain z automations that are more valuable because of their core functionality. But I'm, I'm curious if you have, if you know what that one is for you, but also just like this crazy, like, I didn't even think we could do this, but we're sending data here. It's extracting or receiving a packet of data back that didn't get sent here and compressed and formatted. And like, what's the craziest thing that you guys have automated at Smart Charge America or that you've seen automated? I'd say the first thing that I, I really in, enjoy about, you know, automation, probably really the primary use case for our original automation, but truly the most useful is just the, our customer intake. You know, so, cause Customers go to our website, they find us online, uh, they request a quote, and when that information gets in, and I talk about that in that Zapier talk uh, for anyone that watches it about how that information comes into the system and the multiple, you know, whether it goes to QuickBooks online or it goes into, of course, Airtable, and then also uses it for labeling photos that the customer submits. Because we get these random photos with random names, I, I want to name it with the customer's name and just create information for them and put it in a folder that has a proper naming convention. And for all those things to happen all simultaneously, it's actually multiple zaps. But they're also dependent on each other. It must be timed in just the right way. And only through Airtable were we able to do that. So it puts the information in. Once the, all the photos are loaded, of course, it has to be created in copper first, but then it has to create the Google Drive folder, but it can't put the photos in the Google Drive folder until that folder is created. So yeah, it's a whole sequence of events that must happen in a specific order. And you know, it's air between Airtable and Zapier, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm able to do that. So the amount of work that it goes through and must do in a certain order is just mind blowing sometimes to me, but it's so incredibly valuable because literally all that was done manually prior. Someone would manually create a folder, manually move those and it wouldn't get labeled. So it would be difficult. Because, uh, and the reason that's valuable is because customers input specific photos for specific needs. So they'll send a photo of, this is where I want my charger located in my garage. But if it's it's not in their mind, it's it's photo number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? So it would come into us as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, but my estimator needs to know this is the photo the customer submitted for, this is where I want my charger. So we have to label it that, that wasn't happening, but now it's automated. So it, it's much more powerful. Uh, so that's what, you know, definitely the most useful and kind of good results that we get. Um, but as far as probably the one that I'm most proud of, I'd say, um, and most kind of, wow, I can do this, was the first time I ever worked with uh, creating my own webhooks. So that that's something that, and even more relatively recently, I created a custom web portal that allows me, you know, a little bit of proprietary information here, but I created a custom web portal that allows us to basically scale estimating a much greater number of quotes than we were prior able to accomplish. It's very difficult. You know, we get these photos, we have, have not gone on site. Every other electrician on the planet goes on site to figure out how to quote uh, a scope of work for a customer. I have a team of detectives, basically, of electric, electrical backgrounds that have to take this information, pull from you know, Google Street View, Google Satellite, and piece together a scope of work based on kind of sometimes cryptic photos. We're just not quite sure what this is, or we got to look at the angle of the sun 
when you know we're looking at it is that on the left side or the right side of the house well is that the north or the south side oh let's figure it out they took it at the same time of day therefore i know that this has to be the west side of the house so here, here it's over here you know so there's sometimes funny things like that we have to do um, but ultimately you know i built a portal that allows you know webhooks to be communicated back to copper so it lets copper know exactly what's happening in the web portal and send information back and forth uh real time you know, which is just blew my mind. I was like, we have basically created my own integration. I've created a new web portal. There's no API. And then I use webhooks to effectively integrate it with Copper or with Zapier and is that, Copper. Yeah. Is that, uh, are you using all still Airtable as the underlying database? Yeah. Airtable is a database for like, for instance, pricing uh, and just permit pricing and just uh, countless other pieces of information is the single source of truth. Right, that pull the web portal pulls from it pulls from Google Drive, it pulls from Copper, puts it all together into a singular interface that has role-based access control depending on who's accessing it. it. Almost like a great interface for effectively like its own little CRM kind of, but it's pulling from so many sources to gather the all the information in one pane of glass. And then, did you use a um, tool like Softer or Stacker for that, or did you go full custom? Just this is the nerdy side of me that is. Uh, curious because the, the what you're describing, at least in my opinion, five years ago, is like it's going to cost you millions of dollars in development to hire people and probably lots of mistakes. And now it's like it's not easy, but there is a much more rapid way when you have people that know how to use the tools to spin these things up, like in a very impressive manner, in my opinion. Yeah, so like Zapier now has interfaces, which is in beta currently, which I've been playing around with. I, it wasn't able to give me what I wanted here. So I decided to work with my web developer who has those tools, like kind of like you're describing at his fingertips. I was able to do it, luckily, not for millions of dollars, far less, yeah, yeah. certainly far quicker, um, and also customize it uh, again and again, just for exactly how I need it. So yeah, it's wildly awesome. valuable. Yeah, yeah and I was going to say the... Um... I had this, uh, I just went to Smart Charge America's website. I was just looking at uh, this here. So this is the intake form. Hopefully this will turn on if you can see this. Um, I was just going to say, first of all, the uh, I I'm, this is more of like a strategy or how you handle customers just with detailed, oh, like I was looking at this, and you're looking for their car year make and model, which... Again, in my head, I'm like, oh, that's awesome. You can immediately go pull databases of what's the spec on this car and their charging rate and all that stuff. Uh, so that's awesome. Uh, how many other things do they have in their house? I'm assuming that's useful for electricians to guess, you know, standard uh, usage of a home and all that stuff. So calculation. Can, yes. yes, they can calculate if that's going to need to be upgraded. Um, and then this, I'm assuming this is like we were saying, you're literally asking them put the photo of the front here instead of just upload 20 photos of your project that are now all over the place. You can label this as garage photo for John Smith. Um, and right. That's what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. And so this is, I mean, it's, it's not huge, but it's a very detailed form. Do you have any uh, people that, um, is there even an option? And this is just like, to me, like this is, I would, like love this for myself if I'm the consumer, but consumers that are either don't follow directions well or are technologically challenged or they can't figure out how to upload a photo. Like what, what do you do or how frequent of a problem is that? And the reason I'm asking is because people will tell us or tell me and my company all the time, Hey, we're, you know, this is, we deal with, uh, you know, older people. They're not very tech savvy or they're, they're just concerned about all these edge cases in my opinion and I don't think that it happens as often as we think it's going to happen. But even when it does happen, it ends up, you know, you come up with a solution for those people. But if, if that makes sense, I'm curious, have you had any pushback or problems with the amount of information that someone's required to provide to get a quote? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, there's some people out there that are more <clears throat> maybe technologically, uh, you know, adverse or maybe they're just less savvy or they just don't desire to use their phone at all. They're just, it's too difficult, right? Uh, it's kind of that mental block, if you will. Uh, and so luckily our consumer is pretty technologically savvy because they're bought electric vehicles. So they're kind of on the forefront. 
you know, but that's becoming more and more mainstream. So I'm getting a number of people now that are just, they're not quite as tech savvy or desire to be as technologically, you know, it's just in inclined as, uh, you know, maybe you or I. So in those cases, depending on how busy we are, we'll work with them to basically just have them send us photos, whether, you know, via text or you know, other means, just to make it easy. We'll fill out the form for them because either way, the form has to be filled out. One way, whether my, one of my reps does it, it has to go there. It's the only way to get in. So that that's how we do it. Or we just tell them, hey, maybe that we're just not a good fit for you. You, you know, that sometimes that is sadly, but that's more often than not. That's it's very rare. That that's the yeah. Case. And I was going to say that's the other thing is that uh, it's the classic like automation provides structure, and people feel that structure is limiting or it's not free. I can't do it how I want to, but it's through the structure that you get this freedom of time because it's like, I use the analogy of a train track. Like we just built a train track that's every single quote goes down the same train track and we can increase the volume and the speed because it's the same train track over and over and over and over again. But when you start saying like, oh, here's five different options for you to input data into our system, those are now you're managing five train tracks. It's not impossible, but do you want to upkeep five different train tracks or should you come up with a way to fit every project onto the car? You know, it's a, and the, it's the cargo car, you're like, does it fit in the car? Nope, it doesn't. Can it fit in two cars? All right, then we can't help you. You know, that's not, we can't ship it on this track. I'm just imagining like five tracks all trying to diverge to one track and they're just like hitting each other over and over again. And yes. it's just, it, it, yeah, it's inefficient. Totally. Um, so, uh, yeah, what, else, what other, um, what else is like on your mind or the things that you're passionate about when it comes to automation or scaling? So other things that I want to do is just look at, you know, I, and one of the things you brought up earlier really kind of hit me because it, it's, it's very much true when you think about scalability, because our definition of scalability five years ago is very different than how I interpret it today. Right, because it just, you know, when you're thinking that you're just in one state, you, now we have 50 more plus, you know, other territories to, to conquer. Uh, it's much bigger than that. So we, we really need to think, will this work when there's a thousand? What if there's a thousand more than what we're doing today? Uh, and we, we get hit by that often. I get reminded that I still have some things in our process that are not set up to scale the way they need to scale. Uh, and sadly, some of those I, I don't know how to solve. I mean, that, that's part of the problem, too, is some of these that are just seem insurmountable or just, you know, I'm too busy, right? That's an easy thing to tell ourselves. And that's where I definitely encourage people to get help here and there, you know, if they can find someone or a specialist um, to, to help solve problems. Because oftentimes you have to look outside the box, um, but sometimes we live in a box and so we don't know anything that's outside of it. And if you don't know what's outside the box, someone else does. So, you know, either that or you're going to be spending, you know, a full time job trying to figure that out yourself. And that's you know, is that that's not the business you want to be in, probably. Right. So, yeah. Have you uh, read the book Who Not How? No, I've not. Do you know Dan Sullivan? He he's written a couple really. I would. I mean, they seem popular to me. Um, but that's a. Um, in a, it's a obviously it's a book on the topic that you just said in one sentence. But uh, the world teaches us like when we're presented in the schooling system, education in general teaches you like, here's a problem, figure out how to solve it. Here's a problem, figure out how to solve it. And he says that that's a really backwards way to like, as soon as you get out of school, it's great to solve problems. But if you're trying to run a business, how solve how to solve a problem is not what you should be doing, you should be asking who do I know that can solve this for me, that'll just take it off my plate and crush it. Because the people that are high performers that do that, they're like, just operating at a totally different speed. And I love, I, I love the color that you added, which is we're so limited in what we know in our box that it's like you, but pre air table and after air table, you know what I mean? Like the way that you would even attempt to solve a problem without the knowledge of air table is laughable. But now you're like, Oh, like there's just so many options. Um, so other question I have is, um, as far and so I, I don't know if I told you this, but the primary people that listen to my podcast are um, business owners. I work. Uh, my niche is with painting companies, interestingly enough, um, and so I do a lot of automation specifically for. And we're like a consultant that works with 
these painting company business owners typically. One of the things I'm curious about, uh, because it's all for me, automation is automation and there's, I'm learning things from every single person I talk to, but the challenge that I've found is for any business that we work with, they have to be at a, a decent enough size to actually provide, like to have the pain of a lack of automation be big enough to warrant a discussion, you know? So like if you're doing five paint jobs a month, your whiteboard in your office and whatever other, you know, archaic uh, tools you're using is probably okay. Like you just need to figure out how to grow past that before you start talking about automating things. But at a certain point, you, it's, you decide to automate. And I'm assuming in your situation, you step into a role and there wasn't a lot of automation in place. So you became like the in-house champion to do this. And then as you grow, things get more complicated and the business gets bigger. So I've, and I've had this happen a number of times with these companies I'm working with where when I first started doing this, cause I left a marketing job to do automation. And again, there was this opportunity specifically with this painting network of companies that I was already, that I already knew well. And so that was kind of the natural direction to go, but I'm curious how do you decide or how, what advice would you give someone like, let's say it's a decent sized company and they're trying to figure out who should own the automations internally, or I guess maybe another way to ask it would be the trade-offs of like having an in-house person own it that has knowledge of all the systems and knowledge of automation tools versus outsourcing. Because I think both are there's there's good things about both an outsourced person doesn't really know the ins and outs of your business but then i don't know i don't know if you know this and it's not i don't really have a a point or an answer to this question it's generally like how do have you or how would you advise someone that's like we need automation what do i do because if you just outsource it it's kind of like you don't know if you're getting screwed or if the person's doing it in a smart way because they don't really know your business um, but how do you, how do you leverage or, or balance that? Well, one of the things about, I like about Zapier is they kind of almost democratize it and make it accessible to so many more people that, you know, just wouldn't have been able to automate themselves. So I always look at Zapier as like, uh, you know, kind of that catalyst just to get, let me get your feet wet into automation. Cause in reality, it could be a simple, any, uh, Joe Schmo really <laughs> that just can if you can read, you can figure out Zapier and start to see and learn, you know, if you're using Google Workspace, then there's many ways that I'm confident will help any business help thrive. And you have a CRM or maybe you don't, maybe you're living in sheets. Even then, it'll automatically put information in the sheet for you to start there to start to open up your mind, because then that allows you to see and help quantify how much time and money is this going to save me and is it saving me? And then uh, you get to a certain point where you probably need to figure out, do I need help with this? Because I want to keep doing this, but I don't have time to because the good news, I'm so busy now, right? So you kind of hit a point where you need to make a decision that are you going to outsource this or are you going to get help? Um, in my case, like I, part of the, one of the problems I've had is I'm the internal champion. I'm kind of the, the leader, the thought leader of it. Uh, I've tried to get other people to use it too. So I'm not that single source of failure, if anything, too. Um, but if I like fell off the face of the earth, like we'd be, the company be SOL in a certain respect, which I don't like. I'm not happy about that at all. I need I need to go on a vacation too and just enjoy it and not worry about having to bring my laptop, right? Because that's one of those things. But if you outsource it, then you have someone that understands all of them. I think as you get in, in an increased level of complexity and uh, dependency on automation, because if you ask yourself, if you dip it, your toes into that automation, you know, and then, you know, let's say something goes wrong and you, it just, all of a sudden stops working, could you handle it, right? Or do you need someone to pick that up? You know, would your business crumble with if that automation stopped working? If the answer is yes, then I think you should be at help, you know, because that, that's going to put you in a position where you don't have that single source of failure, right? Because that's, you'll depend on it is what will happen in, in my experience, especially um, because it'll become so foundational and allow you to scale greater, allow you to free up time to spend time with family, instead of having to focus on so many kind of tedious uh, processes. Uh, and so that's, I think everyone's gonna need help eventually when it comes to it, but Zapier's getting better all the time. And also AI, that's one of the things that I'm most excited about right now is the ability to AI, not only to help you can write a Zap with AI now, 
you can say I want to move something from app A to app B and then back to app A and this and that, and then it will write a zap for you based on that, which is, I think is amazing. And Zapier so, has this now? Yes. I think it's in beta technically at the, as of this uh, recording, but it, it is something that, you know, technically you go to chat GPT right now, they, you can It'll tell it to write a zap. To do it. Yeah. yeah. It could basically tell you, Hey, you do this and you do that. And this is how you set it up. I've had it help me write code for me. So, and there was some kind of little bit of code bits that I needed to do and it saved me five steps instead of five steps is one step by using code instead of, you know, these five different tasks, uh, which is more efficient, of course. So that's, and you know, what I wanted to do for me, and I think any business owner does is to help uh, commun customer communication automation. People, the same questions keep coming in over and over again. Why would it not make sense for an AI to pick that out and automatically respond to those questions? Like, so that's what I could start to see as the holy grail of scaling, which I am just, you know, fascinated and want to implement immediately. But I honestly, I, I don't know how I'm kind of at that point where I know I need help in order to do that because the AI is based on a limited database, but I have a database, but AI isn't based on my database. So you'd have to give it a learning model. You know, there's more to it. Yeah. yeah. I start, I, uh, there's another guy, uh, there's a tool called You Can Book Me. I'll see if I can, I'll at least link you guys on LinkedIn. But he has been uh, documenting, it's just been LinkedIn posts, you know, once a week or something. Um, and You Can Book Me is a tool for allowing customers to book appointments, basically. But um, he's been, like his objective that he publicly stated on LinkedIn, and then he's, I think he's done three or four updates it, or maybe maybe it's been more than that. I've seen three or four of them, but it's using AI to respond to roughly eighty percent of their help inquiries. That's his goal, and he thinks that's super attainable. Maybe it can go higher than that, but he's he's kind of said, "Well, I looked at this. This is what happened," and he's hoping that someone maybe has solved this or will see it. You know, but it sounds similar to what you're talking about because I don't I don't have an answer to that, but I know exactly like your head is in the logical spot of. If these are like, I've even thought, should I start, should our company start to save or what's the best way using Airtable potentially to save every inquiry or every question that gets asked and then save the response to each of those questions? Because I assume that that data, when the time comes, you could just upload to chat GPT and say, here's all the questions in the last year that have come in. Here's what our team said back to them. Now do the job, you know, like that should be that theoretically should get you there. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's a, a super, the, the AI piece is, uh, I, I mean, I, it's hard to say. I, I feel like the one thing I know is that the, your, your database and your like source of truth with Airtable, you've got to have clean data. You can't have junk data or a lack of processes. If you have, whatever cool things AI is going to enable, it's not going to enable it for chaos, right? It's going to enable it for people that have structured processes that are already automated or partially, and it's just going to 10 exit, you know? So, and like, like, for example, imagine a company that doesn't have a single form point of entry for requests and they're trying to get AI, but like you do, and now AI enables something and boom, you could take out a huge chunk of work on the back end of what happens after that submission. So I think that's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And just the ability to effectively, I think, you know, the fact that it can create code based on simple layperson language is kind of that conduit that will allow anyone to utilize AI eventually. Right. Because I, I want to do this and I want to do that. I want to make it go over here and over there. And then it just who cares Zapier use Airtable. Who, none of that matters. Just it'll do it. It'll figure it out and it'll build it right. Effectively, that I mean, it's already building websites based on descriptions. So. <laughs> so I'm curious, the uh, other apps, I always love knowing what other people have stumbled across. So we've talked about Zapier, Airtable. What's like your next like top two, three, if you have any other ones are like, Ooh, this has been really cool. Even if it's not heavily used yet, just ones that you're like, you're, you've got your eye on, or maybe there are other things that you found super valuable from just a pure tech side. Yeah. Uh, one that I'm really excited about that I really desperately want to use. And I, I got into app sheet. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar. It's based on object oriented, uh, mobile app development tool that was actually Google purchased. Um, I think a year or two years ago, and they integrated into the kind of 
kind of semi-integrated into Google Workspace, but it basically allows you to create a mobile app based on even just Google Sheets or Google Calendar, or, you, or it's integrated with Zapier or other data sources uh, and capture information or to display information. Uh, and of course, do it into a mobile app, which is incredibly valuable for me because I have a lot of people in the field. So I want to, I use a lot of web forms, but uh, web forms in a mobile browser is very limiting, right? There's no cache. Um, there's not ability to do kind of consistent uploads when I'm uploading maybe a lot of photos or a lot of video. Uh, a mobile app allows me to do much more that simply a form just cannot operate in. And so to be able to kind of consolidate all my forms and the calendar and all the interactions that I have in the field to a single mobile app is incredibly valuable, which could easily be many tens of thousands of dollars, if not much, much more to develop a custom mobile app. But an object oriented uh, app development allows me to integrate with my existing systems. And I, I literally got into it in a couple days and I built a mobile app within days. I mean, I had to you know, definitely, kind of, I've definitely done a lot more to it to iterate on it, um, but I haven't rolled it out just kind of out of fear of the whole push. And, but I see the potential that it can bring me and it's wildly valuable uh, in our use case and certainly can scale far greater than what we're currently doing today. Yeah, that's awesome. Any other ones? So other ones out there that I'm, I'm excited about is kind of building our own customer portal, right? So that allows customers to kind of see their quotes. And I've, I've been playing around with different types of apps that allow for, you know, doing customer signatures, right? Because, I mean, something like DocuSign or these other ones are basically for legal documents. They're very expensive. You know, the most law, law firms and others are using those. Uh, I just do very simple customer, you know, basically approval. Uh, in some cases, maybe a simple payment portal, but you know, there's a lot of products out there that can kind of help with that, but to maybe work within our, you know, quoting platform, but also, you know, integrate back to our CRM and then use Zapier one way or another to do that uh, is kind of one of the things that I'm essentially still looking for. I haven't quite figured that out yet, um, but I've, I've seen a couple apps out there that seem kind of exciting, like Sign Now is one of them. Um, or I think Zapier interfaces has the potential to do that because they're working on a payment portal, kind of customer approval, oh, nice. and it could be a two-way database. So it can um, you know, basically display information back to a user uh, as well. Um, and it even has some potential to integrate with Zaps in a way that allows Zaps to do what they need to do, but also allow a little bit of human interaction because sometimes certain things you want to structure can be difficult to structure, but you can kind of semi-structure it whilst, while still allowing a certain element of human interaction. So in other words, something comes up, it says, hey, this is the zap that we have in mind. Should we proceed? You say, yes, you're right. You know, so in other words, I imagine that would be valuable if you're using AI to answer emails. AI will come up with a standard response and you're there to say, yes, this is right. I approve or no, hey, change it a little bit and then send it out. So it's got so much potential to kind of have a human element and the structured zap you know, element uh, kind of blended together, but still efficient. Yeah. The, um, there's two that, uh, last couple questions here would be book recommendations. So if, I'm going to ask you for three book recommendations while you're thinking about that and share two different apps for you, with you. Uh, I literally three weeks ago, I'm like super intrigued by this. Um, and I actually have one of our VAs using this for my inbox but it's a tool called ply.io. Have you heard of this? Uh, no. So ply.io, I'm like very, it's such a, like it's, you are probably one of the five people in, that I'll tell in the next month that will actually be able to like see what's possible. Because you could think of it as like, it's actually very close to what you just described where you have automations built, but in a contextual like process that you're already doing. So like, what I'm using it for, for my own sake is we have like customers will email me because I started it just as my as a business with just me. Now I have a team of five people and I'm, I've handed off my email to someone else to manage all of the email because most of it's like support stuff and I just need to know about the stuff that I need to know about. So whenever I get an email, which is, uh, I would say 80% of the emails that need responding are support tickets. And rather than giving these customers like a really cold, like, hey, please use our, you know, Zendesk submission form for your issue. And they're like, oh, I just need this you know, thing to work. Uh, she pushes a button. So it actually ply makes a button inside of Gmail that she pushes. And then it brings up an interface 
in Gmail for like a couple checkbox questions of like, is this an error or a ticket or a request or whatever? And then she like puts in, you can customize it to say whatever you want. Like when's this gonna be due? And she hits a button and then it automatically uses chat GPT to write a response to what they said. So, cause it's taking all the information contextually for from what that email said. And it goes and makes the ticket inside of Airtable and assigns it to the person on our team who's gonna look at this and sends them a notification, all that stuff. And it's all stuff that's like very stand, like it's the same thing you're saying where it's like this happened, you know, I get 15 emails a day that are like this and she can now do something in about 30 seconds that would take, you know, three to five minutes, not terribly long, but now she can get through my entire inbox in 30 minutes instead of three hours, you know? Um, so anyways, apply to IO and that's like, again, the I it's also I don't know if it integrates with copper. I know it integrates with HubSpot. So we've created little just little functions that are useful inside of our CRM system to like generate new deals quickly with a bunch of default information or whatever is like common. But that's like uh they're they're new. They're I don't know how long they've actually been out, but they don't even have pricing yet, or maybe they do now, but they're so early that they're just trying, they don't even know what to charge. So I've never seen this before, but they're just basically saying, if you sign up for beta, we'll give you special pricing and we'll tell you what that pricing is gonna be and we'll give all of our beta users a discount, so to speak, um, which is also kind of a tricky thing because you know then they've, then they've got you and who knows, I'm, I'm sure they'll have a reasonable price, but uh, that's a really cool one. And the other one I was gonna say is uh, tango.us. And that's another one, I don't know if you've heard of that one. That's a uh, process documentation tool that is also like it's not an automation tool so to speak but it makes documenting processes unbelievable so especially if you do a lot of stuff web-based um and there, I'm, t I'm telling you this because i haven't shared this to any other listeners on the podcast but these are two apps that are like top of mind for me right now so anyone that has to document processes, which I would say is anyone that owns a business. <laughs> and then the other, the first one ply is just like, it's amazing The like, it's these very niche things that require contextual information in order to automate. And those are the two that are, uh, I think are just really, really powerful. The tango one is like, you just record yourself doing a task and then it keeps track of like every website you visited. It like takes screenshots of the things that you clicked on. And it's like, it turns documenting, like, again, cuts that down by a 10th of the time, probably. That's cool. I've been using screenshot or screen record on my Mac to try to basically record me doing something to train people, but then record my voiceover while I'm doing it. That's kind of at least the way I've been getting around doing it, but that's, you know, it doesn't always work well. Yeah, someone else told me that when you do video documentation, uh, if the process changed, then you got to shoot a whole new video. But exactly. If, but if the right. but if it's a just a step by step list and you swap out a step, then you just change that step and everything else is still true, you know. Absolutely. Um, You're right. But anyways, uh all right, last couple questions. Three book recommendations. I always ask everybody for books. It doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be pertaining to the topic today, but just three books that you found that you like the most, that you recommend the most or or whatever. So, one of my favorites uh that goes back to, you know, what I like to call the highly effective people are the seven habits of highly effective people. So classic book out there. I've heard countless times in business uh, that it, I almost recite on easily a couple times a week. I talk to my employees about one element in there and anyone that's interested Start in automation. Start with the end in mind. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, just be just about priority and urgency, importance and urgency, and how do you, you know, use those in a way to, in a context to help you decide what to do and or what to automate. Right. So it could be used in so many ways to build the construct of how do you want to be productive that day? Uh, then, of course, the follow up the eighth habit, another one that I that I'm a big fan of. Um, and then the uh, third one, actually, let's see, that's the Sandler sales rules. Cause I'm a sales guy at heart. I got it sitting behind me. Um, but, you know, Sandler sales training is kind of one of those things that's been around for a while. But there's a lot of elements in there that I love to do and talk to my sales reps about. Um, and just, uh, you know, we use it on a daily basis. For What's sure. that one called? Sandler what? Sandler sales rules. Yep. The same or the Sandler rules back there. I'll just pull it only because I have sitting right behind the me. Sandler rules. Yeah. The Sandler rules. So they, they have training and other things you can do, but I, I love kind of timeless selling principles that it offers. And then, yeah, we implement it 
quite often. That's awesome. Um, and then last question, favorite movie. This is just for fun. I always like to know the what movies you like. And it could be one, a classic or a recent. You know, it's so funny. Like one of these movies that I always come back to and just – I always laugh when I watch it is, uh, and I'm an Adam Sandler fan at heart. You know, I used to watch all, of course, all his movies, get his CDs, but Happy Gilmore. For whatever reason, every time I see it, I always just giggle like a little kid, and I always find joy in it. And uh, I just, you know, it, it's not the best movie ever. I'm not going to say that, but I, I just I always like going back to it and watching it. And so that's, I, that's did, my I pick. haven't seen it in a while, but I feel like uh, I always think of the uh, Jackass. That's just a, probably one of the most quoted lines on a golf course. Has to be. Yeah. Or Bob Barker. You, <laughs> you punch Bob Barker. <laughs> awesome. Well, David, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on today. Uh, this was fun. Hopefully everyone learned something. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you around. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you for your attention and listening to this episode of The Pursuit of Purpose. Your feedback and comments mean the world to me. If you liked what you heard, please take a second, leave me a five-star review on iTunes. If you've got suggestions for future episodes or just want to say hi, shoot me an email at chris at chriskiefer.com. Don't forget, I make it a point to include all the links to the books, movies, and resources mentioned on this episode in the show notes. You can see those directly below in the description or on my website, chriskiefer.com. Thanks so much, guys.